But here's something else I wanna paint a picture. I wanna paint a more actionable picture to you guys, one that matters now that I think you need to seriously consider, which is that we implemented something recently where every single person that unsubscribes from the Wine Library email service, we call with a human being. And we apologize, or you know, sorry we sent 40 emails in one day, or whatever we're doing. That we absolutely ask everybody with human equity why they unsubscribed and what can we do. I think this might matter to you guys, check this out. We have reconverted 40% of the people that tried to unsubscribe from our email newsletter. 40. You guys want to hear something better? Of that percentage, their average spend of that group is up 70%. Why? Because we created context. Because we showed them that we're not faceless and that we care. And so these are the things that matter. I believe that the reason, do you know what I almost called this book? Do you know why this book was called The Thank You Economy? It was because my last book, Crush It, sold ridiculously well out of left field. Everybody was like, why did this guy's book sell so many copies? What they did not know and what I believe so much and I believe is not being done at all in the marketplace is I paid forward. I did a thousand episodes of Wine Library TV for free. I answered hundreds of thousands of emails. Do you know how many times I've asked and answered, excuse me, not answered. Do you know how many times I've been asked and I've answered what wine goes with fish? (laughs) Fuck. Like 200,000. I need somebody like write me a program where I could just hit F5 and just answer that shit. I mean, so many, but I did it. And I responded to tens of thousands of tweets, tons of the facebook.com slash Gary comments, everything I could, giving, 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 answering, answering, service, not trying to sell, not push, service above being a merchant, giving, 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 so that when I finally came out, with something that cost $20, I almost called the thank you economy guilt marketing. I guilted my fans and users to buy my book. I gave so much that they literally couldn't look themselves in the mirror and not buy the book. (laughs) They're like, shit, the guy's answered 400 of my emails. I really believe in this. See, what, what you guys may not know and what I think most businesses don't understand, and the way I live my life is this. I am not here today because I hope that you guys buy the thank you economy. I'm not here today that I hope I give a good speech and I go outside and then you guys all buy the book and I sign it. I have actually no interest in your short-term business. The reason I'm here today is I wanted to come to the biggest event in this country and create as much context with as many people as I possibly could. That next time I come, Not three people, thanks by the way, stand up and cheer, but 40. And 30 years from now, 4,000. That I firmly believe the way to build business is to run a marathon, not a sprint. And that I've watched so many people go out of business running sprints. That I believe all these deal of day sites, so many of them will go out of business because there's no real brand connection. That it's just a faceless service and they're buying $20 worth of sushi for $10 but the company that understands how to build lifetime value wins. Here's something I want you to think about, and this is really fucked with my head. I consider myself a very good creative. I came up with Thank You Economy, right? I think I'm smart. I've come, every time I wrote an email for Wine Library through the decade, it always sold more, because I came up with a good title, and I gave a better story or more information. I think a lot of people here would pride themselves as good marketers or good creatives. I've got some news for you that I think is very fascinating. How many people here are UX or UI designers? Raise your hand. All right, get ready for your big shout out. It is my firm belief that because of UI and UX and because of A-B testing and because I spend a lot of time with the guys from Living Social, which is Groupon's biggest competitor in the US, that I've spent a lot of time with the kid that created Farmville, that I pay attention to what Zenga's doing and all these other people, that the acquisition funnel, the way we get customers, has been mapped. That everybody here who's creative in marketing will not be able to beat this guy with enough A-B testing. That if you look at your website, as great of a marketer as I am, and as many good stories as I think, and as smart as I think I know what people wanna buy and what kind of wine, 
that because of data, we can design that page 800 ways all over, understand which colors and words have the best ROI, and when you click, they look at the data, and they show you, and you move on. It has been mapped. It is my belief over the next five years that that science will be perfected at some level. It is why retargeting banner ads and Google conversions are mattering so much. It's why the biggest growth is happening with the companies that are really pushing forward in that space. And that the entire battle for all of us in e-commerce is not gonna be customer acquisition as it has been for a very long time. And what that means is we're all gonna be in one business. We're all in the eyeballs and ears business, but that's going to be mapped, converted, and we're gonna figure it out. So what we're all gonna really be in is in the lifetime value business in the retention business. How do you keep them? Because that is what I'm seeing from the people that know how to map this stuff, what they're struggling with, what they're not capable of. They're regurgitating emails and user accounts over and over, and if they're good, they keep more than they lose, and that's why they grow. It is my belief that customer service is not going to be a part of the industry, but it is the culture that will trickle down throughout the company, and those companies that have, and this is a very important word, The word that I live by, by the way, the big word, intent. What's the intent of your business? Is it just to scrap out as much cash from the consumer? Or is it to become something more than just the merchant? I always tell my friends that have e-commerce companies or businesses, I'm like, be bigger than a merchant. That's why I did Wine Library TV. I created content, education, and engagement with my users. I wanted to bring more than just selling them some random burgundy or Malbec at a good price. And that context that I created with them created the equity. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you were aware, and this may not cross over to e-commerce as much, but it might, just curious. How many of you were aware of what Old Spice did where they took the guy from the commercials and he went on YouTube, made 100 videos, and made a lot of noise on the internet. It was a huge internet kind of thing. It was like the social media campaign of the decade. Just by show of hands, how many of you were aware of that? Raise your hand. All right, quite a bit. So more than have PVRs. Shit. Sorry. Fine. I'm going to paint the picture for the rest of you because this is where it really matters. Because besides the word context and besides mapping acquisition of customers, one of the biggest things that I want you guys all to leave with tonight is that there is no such thing as a social media campaign. Do not get caught saying in your organization what's gonna be a social media campaign for us, or what's the campaign? Or if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got a social media campaign for them, remember the thing earlier, the punch in the mouth? Do that. (laughs) I'm gonna tell you why. Here's what Old Spice did, and got really famous in the US for in that age, back to the Super Bowl comment over there, they can't stop writing about it. And if you go to any social media conferences, it will be a case study for somebody during one of their talks. They did a great job. I'm a big fan, you know, even though I bashed it earlier, I still do believe in traditional media. I still do. I just don't believe in the prices. The pricing is the problem. It still works. I just want to pay for the reality of how it works. They took a commercial and created context. We all knew who the character was. They took that character into YouTube and made 100 different videos. They did something I believe in, which is I think you're all going to understand, which I believe we're in the dawn of one-on-one marketing. That the days of scale, stack it high, let it fly, are changing very quickly. That one-on-one marketing really matters. And they did that. They made 100 videos for individual people. They got a lot of buzz. They were smart. They went to normal people, but they also went to Kevin Rose, founder of Dig, Alyssa Milano, famous actress, and they link baited, and they got a lot of noise. And they picked up 150,000 followers on Twitter in a heartbeat, 24 hours. But in the nine months since that campaign, all they've done is push marketed. Here's a coupon, here's this. And they have not engaged with more than two people. They have not at replied, answered a question, engaged with anybody. That's like the wonderful organizers of this event promoting it to you, you guys all show up and we don't. That's what Old Spice did. So everybody's knocking over themselves to crown Old Spice for having a great campaign and the problem is they're treating it like traditional marketing. And listen, I want you to continue to buy Google ads and I want you to continue to email and I want you to look at banner retargeting and I want you to look at all this stuff but I'm firm belief, just like you make fun of people who have a bricks and mortar store because you beat them on innovation 
Or like I made fun of all the wine stores who were faxing their offers in 1988, 99, and 2000 when I started emailing and that's why I crushed their faces. There is a culture shift of substantial substance that is starting to brew right now. And here is the biggest problem. You're not gonna be able to throw money at this. That's all, you guys, well actually you guys are all pretty quiet. Let me say it one more time. You are not going to be able to throw money at this. I bought the word wine on Google AdWords and innovation for five cents and dominated. Today I do not own the word wine as the first result buying from Google because wine.com pays $9 for that word, okay? They weren't as good as me, that's why they've sold four times and I grew, but today they can attack it or fix it by spending money. The first people that laughed at television who all thought the radio was still gonna be king and TV went and commercials worked, three or four years later, once they realized what was happening, they threw money at it and they had more commercials and they won. This has been the common thing. Email newsletters, if you spent enough money to require enough people in, you could catch up with money. Here is the problem of the battlefield that I see right now that is gonna bother a lot of people in this room when in 24 months they go, ah, crap, we were wrong. Okay, let's start doing social. You cannot buy friends. You can't do it. And for anybody here who's ever dated somebody who dated somebody right before them for five or six years, you know that there's equity in that prior relationship. That when you start dating, you're not just automatically the love of that person's life. That there's a lot of emotional equity from the prior relationship. And it takes you years to catch up to be the one. Right? That is what we're gonna see happen. That I believe that if McDonald's and Burger King went two separate ways tomorrow, and Burger King continued to spend, 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 and McDonald's, instead of spending on platforms, and here comes the kicker, spent on people? Yeah, it is funny, right? It's funny. It's just so funny for me. If they actually spent on human beings, back to that gentleman, instead of spending four fucking million dollars on a Super Bowl commercial, they spent $50,000 a year on 80 human beings for the year to engage with everybody that cares about their brand and is talking about it because we can map it and see it. We don't have to pay for the data. It is out there that there's a far bigger ROI. And that's what's so interesting to me. That as this becomes all about gadgets and technology and new this and iPads and iPad 7 and fucking all this new shit, the equity and the value is in the humans because that's going to be the battleground. What brand can out-humanize their competitor? This is a very fascinating time. Substantial stakes, high stakes, because I'm telling you, companies are gonna scramble to catch up and they're gonna have a very tough time because in America, for the 950,000 people that follow me, you're gonna have a son of a bitch time to become the wine guy for them because I've been talking to them for six years. And I've answered what wine goes with fish. (laughs) And so what matters to me is what companies can be a service. Why can't, I met a couple people today that are doing e-commerce with technology, with with gadgets, with, with technology and actual physical products, not software. Why can't a company like Best Buy or some of the people I met in this room tonight scour the web for all the conversations that are gonna become the equity of our world and instead of just selling merchandise, they become the service, even if they don't sell your product. In this book, I have an example of a guy who saw a tweet of somebody complaining about a phone service. He understood the system he was working with because it was his number one competitor's system, not his. He tweeted for 25 minutes and helped the guy figure out what was wrong, back and forth. Three months later, their phone system contract went up and they switched providers to the guy that helped them. One tweet, $300,000 account. You know what I call that? Fucking ROI. (laughs) Let me give you another ROI example. Caesars Casino Group, client of ours. There's something called CES. Beginning of January, I don't know if any of you guys have ever gone. Consumer Electronics Show, big deal. Thank you for coming, sir. Have a great night, thank you. 
They wanted us to watch every conversation at CES. We did. One guy goes, does anybody know where I can watch the Junior Olympic hockey match today? CES. One of my guys sees it, he calls Caesars Casino Group. He goes, hey, Caesars, do you guys have this playing at Caesars Palace? They said, yes. Can you reserve a table for John Thompson? Yes. He tweets at John Thompson, a couple other people see it, and four or five people go to Caesars and they watch the Olympic hockey match. The next day, in the guy's Twitter account, it says, checking out of the win, checking into Caesars. You know what I call that? Fucking ROI. And you know what's so funny? Every time I tell these stories and I give these examples to my clients, big companies, I'm a small entrepreneur, I'm talking about Pepsi, Campbell's, NHL, things like that. How do you scale it? I always hear that. Well, that's nice, Gary, but how do we scale it? Well, I don't know. Stop spending your marketing money on dumb shit. (laughs) Spend it on people, and we can scale the living crap out of this. And I mean it. And that's what I see. I see a world where It's not gonna matter how good your creative is because if they're not consuming it, you can't sell it. You know, if they're not seeing it, for example, the current recent study that's about to come out, that the average 24 and under, when asked to recite what's at the top or the right side of a website, can't tell you. You know why? They've grown up in the internet era. And you know what's on the top and the right side? Banner ads. They can tell you everything in the middle and the left. Could not recall anything. They're not seeing it. It's a blind spot a literal blind spot to the consumer. I'm very fascinated by this. I think mobile is gonna have a tremendous impact. I think we're gonna shop. You know, by the way, real quick, remember we're doing the whole punch in the mouth? I got one more for you. This is random, but I gotta tell you, Sweden, this is my favorite one. I hate ideas. The next time one of your friends says to you, oh shit, they stole my idea, kick them in the neck. (laughs) Ideas are bullshit. Execution is the game. You can shake your head all you want during this talk right now. If you don't go back and do it, you won't get the equity. If I wrote a book about push-ups, and I was like, yeah, push-ups are good. When you do them, you get muscles. Clearly, I don't do them. You have to do them to get the results. Ideas and talk are horseshit. Execution is the game. And if you don't start executing shortly, I have a feeling it is going to negatively impact your business. It is absolutely, positively difficult to build context without doing it. And it's as simple as a thank you, a wink, any piece of context that you can create with the end user is gonna matter because at the end of the day, we've all been paying Google and we're paying Facebook right now and we're paying the direct mail company and everybody else to get to the end user but we can get to them now ourselves. And we can create dramatically more context. Because when your friend says, I just had a delicious bagel at Starbucks, and it's your friend, social context, it matters a lot more to you than seeing a Starbucks banner ad. The dawn of contextual, real life, one-on-one marketing is here. You can smell it, you can taste it, it's on the verge, but people are gonna still debate what the ROI of spending time on Facebook and Twitter is. And while they do, somebody like Netflix is gonna come in and put you out of business. So I highly recommend, and now I wanna go to Contextual because I've talked a whole lot and I'm excited to actually listen to you guys and engage with you. I just beg you, I implore you to realize this isn't Zen shit. This is how we're gonna sell shit. Thank you. Please take a seat. Thank you. In your book, you talked about how important it is to employ people who have genuine interest in the customers. How do you detect this quality in someone you consider employing? You fire fast. (laughs) I'm serious. I have no idea. I'm not fucking Yoda. You just you hire, and if they don't have it, you fire. You fire fast. Fire fast. (laughs) <laughs> Jimmy, any questions? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm so, uh, I like this, I like this Thank very you. much. Thanks, I, man. I, uh, it is very uh, easy to forget the customer if you're on internet. We all say it, yeah. we all say it, but we don't execute against it. Exactly. And for the first time ever, the platforms allow us to execute, I mean, I understand why we didn't execute against it. First of all, let's all be honest, one negative customer's voice wasn't big enough, right? Now, 
Little phone action, do, do, do. Let me tell you a story. My brother, AJ, and my mom were having dinner. My brother calls, the restaurant says, hey, do you have a table open for 5.30? They said, if you come right now in 10 minutes, we do. They were right around the block. They were there in two minutes. And my brother, AJ, is such a straight shooter, I guarantee it was two minutes, right? They get there and they're like, oh, I don't know who took your call, but you're gonna have to wait 45 minutes. My brother takes out his phone to let me know that he's gonna be later because we, we're gonna meet afterwards. The hostess goes, whoa, whoa, whoa runs in the back and they seat him. AJ, living in our world, is like, what just happened? She goes, well, I didn't want you to write a negative review on Yelp or Twitter it out, so we sat you. So, the moral of the story is, when somebody gives you bullshit customer service, take out your phone like you mean it. (laughs) (laughs) It's gonna work. (laughs) All right. Thanks, I like claps, yes. All right, we seem to have some problems with uh, people twittering. They seem to be spellbound. Oh, so that, well, that's good. That's flattering. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sweden. <laughs> so, so, but uh, some people have tweeted. Okay. And um, they're a bit like, uh, they go like... Um, Give me a tough one. Who says I'm full of shit? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, good. No. Thank you, Sweden. <laughs> so, uh, um, a, a complete Thai department, thank you, economy department, seems yes. a bit much. Push seems a bit simple. Yeah. So what are the first baby steps? <sighs> Listening. I agree. I, I, if you don't have Google alerts, and if you're not going to search.twitter, and I, again, hearing the numbers of users of Twitter here, I can respect that. But you know, there's Facebook search now too, as open statements are. And again, there may be a platform. Jimmy, is there a platform of communication that I'm not aware of that really matters here? Uh, I don't like technology. Is that a website? <laughs> oh, oh, is that what you were saying? I didn't understand jack no. shit. I was sitting there like, what's going on up there? I have uh, two employees Got that it. fix that, so. Got it. Whatever the, listen, whatever the technology platforms are where people talk, you need to be listening to it. It is such a missed opportunity. It's amazing. When you engage with somebody who says something negative about you and you take the high road, they like you more than when they started. We all know that, we feel that way. So I would say the first step is, before you hire somebody just for the thank you department and go on the offense sending people stuff, I gave you the example of uh, the giving somebody a jersey. What I didn't give you the example of and some of the people in the morning heard was uh, you know, one person was, that we were also following kept talking about barbecue. He loves barbecuing, he loves to barbecue, he likes to eat barbecue, so Kristen, spent a whole three, four hours of her day one day putting together, he lived in Kansas City, all the best barbecue spots. She called a couple of them and told him he was a fan. They gave some free meals. She emailed, and together we sent him content. You know, the best barbecue bloggers, uh, two tickets to a barbecue festival, and it was just effort. He was so thankful of the effort. He was more excited than the guy that we actually gave a jersey to. Effort is underrated. Execute it. All right, now, now you've given two examples of one big, big customer and uh, maybe a few squeak wheels. You have, yes. Yeah, you have greased. But um, this morning you talked about the large middle group. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, so how do you, t- how do you um, tend to all, if you have low margin products and a very large uh, customer base? Yeah, listen, at the end of the day, you guys heard a lot of stuff up here, but no one shoe fits all, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know your individual businesses so much better than I do. Wine, for example, we re- why I'm always so confident, I'm in a very low margin business. Very low. I actually fucked it up. I started price warring in America, and so I screwed up wine. I'm sorry, America. Um, but we're in very low margin. At the end of the day, though, you're in your business, you're in your business. I always say to my dad, don't fight the market. The market is the market. You don't want to be in this market? Go sell something else. So you're in your reality. What you want to do, though, regardless if you have low margin, big middle, you know, you can always evolve. Don't forget, Nintendo started out selling playing cards. Just because you sell sound equipment today or just wine today, we recently launched Gourmet Library, now we're gonna sell tea and cheese and, and mixed nuts and the fact of the matter is, is that it's a very high margin business and the reason we were able to convert so many customers so quickly is because we were good to them. The point he was making I made earlier in our session, I'm obsessed with the middle. I think a lot of us don't look at it. We look at our whales, our biggest customers, right? And then we take care of all the squeaky wheels, whoever complains, right? Who's, right? Jimmy, you know, you wanna punch yeah, them in yeah, the yeah, face, yeah. right? <laughs> and you're bigger and stronger than me. You know, the squeaky wheels, right? So we take care of the big dogs, and we take care of the squeaky wheels, but there's amazing middle, which is probably all of us, right? We don't complain, we don't spend a whole lot. 
I started becoming obsessed with me because I'm that kind of customer. There's a lot of places where I spend money. I'm not the biggest customer of their store. I never will complain. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I can never complain. I just don't have it in me. I mean, the waiter can serve my food, take the bottle, hit me over the head, and I'll just walk and be like, I'm not going back there. I don't complain. <laughs> But I started becoming obsessed with me because there's a lot of places I spend a lot of money, but they're only getting 3% of my total spend on the category. There's another place that has me as a whale. I think a lot of you are sitting on customer data right now of customers that you don't view as big because you don't have the context of their potential wallet spend. And I think when you start surprising them and doing the right thing by them, and the way I'm looking to do it is by attaching their data to who they are on the web and understanding what they care about, whether it's fishing, whether it's horseback riding, car racing, audio, music. We bought one customer a $100 gift card to iTunes, lost his mind, he's up 7,000% with us. We didn't know, he was shopping most of his wine from a local store because he liked supporting local, even though we were cheaper, but once we created emotional context with him, he switched his legency, local didn't matter as much, context trumped local. I'm very fascinated for you guys to comb through your middle data. I know this is progressive thinking. Listen, I know that there's different dynamics between Sweden and the US market. I'm ahead of this in the US. Even in the US, a lot of people are like, you know, what is this? This is kind of weird, you know, it's new, you know. So I could understand and respect if you walked out of here like, hey, fascinating, but not practical. But I implore you that if you want to be in business over the next 10 years, that if you're not retiring tomorrow, start sprinkling at least some of this stuff. Start hedging a little bit. The dividends are substantial. If they didn't start you know, having a web commerce, that they would have never started the process to actually closing the physical store. You've got to start hedging your bet in the reality of the marketplace. And the reality of the marketplace is we are all gonna live digital lives. Very shortly, every person in this room is going to put out something digitally every day of the year, and that's gonna matter. Right, so first you destroyed email. Yes. Then you destroyed wine. Yes. And then you uh, told Nike to destroy sneakers. Mm -hmm. So uh, if everyone is starting to give out things, how how is Nike going to to make money? Well listen, I scared the shit out of Nike recently. I, uh, I spoke at Nike and I said, What happens when LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul go to China, they know where you're producing the sneakers, produce their own sneakers, go home, do a Groupon, because it's big enough, to sell a bunch of sneakers, and then keep all the money. They're the equity. You know what this is? These guys are the music industry. They're in the middle. How many of you are familiar with Pandora? Raise your hand. Great. So what happens when your refrigerator becomes Pandora? What happens when your refrigerator in a couple years understands the products that you put into your refrigerator and it uses RFID and scans and it understands that you drink Pepsi and that when there's only one Pepsi left, it reorders the product for you and it's delivered to your home? You know who's in trouble? Costco and Walmart and whoever the big retail chains are here. Guys, it started with music 10 years ago. Everything in the middle is going to have to provide more than just delivering product or it will not exist. That may be the last book I write with a publisher. Why am I sharing 50% with them? All they do is print it. I can do that. The world's changing very fast. And the reason I'm so passionate and so out there on this conversation is that what I talk about and what I concern myself with is creating relationship with the end user. That is absolutely the single most important thing for a business and where all the value comes in, period. They're the ones who pay your bills, period. Can you give us some advice on how to make CEOs aware of the importance of social media and caring for customers? CEOs are gonna struggle because if they're a public CEO or they have a board, they're playing a sprint, not a marathon. They've gotta report numbers today. Their bonus relies on today. And so, you know, it's gonna be very difficult. What I would tell you is instead of like worrying about changing the CEO's mind, focus on being right. The best thing you can do is tell this story if you believe it, because everybody in the room is watching and paying attention. And in five years, when that CEO gets fired, because they don't know what the fuck they're doing, somebody's gonna step in, and if they see that you knew where the world was going, you will have a lot of equity. And that matters, and I mean that. 
That's a practical answer. It's very difficult to convince CEOs and other companies. If they don't believe in it, if they don't see the ROI, and let's not forget, in today's world, most CEOs are very black and white numbers driven. As it evolves and it becomes more about emotion, it will change. But if they don't see the ROI, if Nielsen's hasn't come down and blessed the ROI of Facebook yet, they can't wrap their head around it. So you need to be on the right side of history. That's building personal brand equity, which will matter for you long term. Any questions from you? What's up, guys? Yeah, I, I can come up with a question. Um, is this, how much did you pay for this jersey you paid on eBay? Um, I think it was a $600 item. $600. Okay, because I'm, I'm just thinking, if you put this expectation to the customer, that customer every time will get this jersey in the package with his wine, then you'll put the barn really high, and it'll be hard for you as an e-commerce company to deliver every time. So let me clarify, we didn't send the jersey with the wine. No? The wine he already bought. We came back two weeks later after we looked at his data and sent him a jersey as a thank you. Because this order was so big, so you, it makes yeah, it was, sense. It hap you know, in hindsight, I fucked up and shouldn't have done it with him because when people hear the story, they think big and big, you know? It's yeah. much more practical. The next guy we did, the barbecue guy from Kansas City, his uh, order was $73. And on our margins, we made 14 bucks before expenses, yeah. <laughs> right? And we spent four hours on a well-paid employee to put together the content. Yeah. It's not about that. It's about knowing that he'll talk about it right, social equity, and even if he didn't talk about it, intent. The, the culture I want to instill in my company is that we're gonna to go to a different place because I'm telling you, you know, as a very smart gentleman early said to me outside during my book signing, he said he sells sports uh, products here and he's done really well. He said, I don't think price really matters. And he's right, price can be trumped by a lot of things. Um, that's why Amazon bought Zappos. Zappos was out selling Amazon on some key items when they were more expensive, and Amazon's a much bigger brand. They were winning on culture, not on price. So, yeah, we're, 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 I want to make the expectations of the consumer high. It's a competitive advantage because we're starting the process in my industry, and excuse me, in my company to have that kind of culture. It's bottle shock you know, to a lot of other companies to go there, and it'll take them a long time to catch up, just like they all made fun of my father for letting me launch a website. They thought it was stupid. They didn't think people would put their credit card into a computer. Guys, as an e-commerce conference, and if you've been doing it for a long time, you've all heard the arguments before. You heard it the first time around with e-commerce. Now it's gonna be about the social stuff. You already know the answer. So what are you waiting for? Mm. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Last question. <laughs> okay. So, Gary. What are you gonna, gonna tell us in your next book? Um, I'm not sure. I actually don't think I'm gonna write a book for a while. I, I'm getting a little tired of talking and being a pundit. Um, I feel like the reason I mattered in the first place is I executed. I feel the next chapter of my career will be back to execution. I've got a couple ideas of what I wanna do with a wine of the month club, using some of the things I talked about tonight. Um, there's also the ideas of doing something completely outside of the wine space just a startup idea I have with my brother AJ. VaynerMedia is well on pace to be a 10 to $20 million agency next year, so I've gotta put some execution there. I have a two-year-old daughter, Misha, and I miss her and I don't wanna travel. So I think the next chapter, next three years, are gonna be execution, build some more wealth, something that's scalable. Um, and then in four years, three years, who knows, could be two years, could be tomorrow, I could change my mind, but after I execute, the whole world will be different. Mm. You know how different the world's gonna be in three years? Mm. We're gonna be talking about augmented reality shopping. We're gonna be talking about virtual currency. We're gonna be talking about Pandora refrigerators. So I, uh, I have no idea what I'm gonna talk about. I'm, you know, what I tend to write about is things that I've done. I'm usually very early, so I'm able to still write about it and it's not old. Mm -hmm. And so I'll probably write about something I've done because I already know the ROI. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm terribly sorry to have to stop this Q&A session. But now it's possible for everyone to meet Gary, ask some questions and say hi. Thank you so much for coming and give my regards to your family for Thank letting you. us have you here in Stockholm for a couple of days. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so Behan, much. Behan, Gary Vaynerchuk. Two things. Am I about to go to book signing? Yeah. I just want to, I just want to say, thank you. I want to say one thing. I really, really hope that if you have a debate or a thought, that all of you later tonight, if you remember, go to facebook.com slash Gary 
maybe say hello. I'd love to create more context with all of you. Uh, that and I wanted to brag that I had facebook.com slash Gary. <laughs> Thank you. You can meet Gary in Nordic e-commerce knowledge. I'm gonna go sign some books. Yeah, you're gonna sign some books. Right Thank now? you very much. Yes, right now. Right now. Thank you guys so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs>